folks, I just want to remind you all that you are the power behind this organization and that you are all detectives on your own. And whatever you can bring to share with all of these folks who are in these squares, don't ever think that some small thing that you have achieved is not worth speaking about because it's all those little things that build up to a calm, precious lifestyle. So with that, Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Stacy. thank you for joining us today. We're really uh, honored and excited to have you join us here at the ALS Talk Series. As you can see, um, there are over probably 200 people today already joined. We are very eager to hear about you. And as an introduction, um, Dr. Stacy Lindbergh is co-CEO at Brainstorm Therapeutics, where she has led the clinical program for Neuron. Uh, through readout, analysis, and BLA filing. Stacy also is leading the regulatory review process and build out of the company for the future, uh, a biostatistician by education with a PhD in statistics from Baylor University. Stacy is a board director and senior executive with multinational experience in R&D, strategy development, analytics, and big data. Stacy has close to three decades of drug development experience across multiple pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies and has contributed to the development and approval of no novel drugs for devastating diseases. Please join me in welcoming our incredible speaker for tonight, Stacy Lundberg. Thank you, Indu. Well, it's an honor to be here today and to have a discussion around Neuron's data package. Indu, I want to thank you and the broader Everything ALS organization for the invitation and your ongoing leadership in the ALS space. Um, it's inspiring to see what you're doing with technology and the innovations that technology and data science um, can bring to support people living with ALS. Uh, you're creating a really collaborative environment um, with a set of partners that I believe will change the lives of people with ALS in the future. So thank you for that. So today I've chosen to go on the lighter side in terms of the number of slides I'll present today. Um, I'm hoping then to have plenty of time for questions and discussion. I have additional content I can share, but I want this to be driven by your interest. So I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Today we'll review Neuron as a product, the clinical development plan, and then turn our focus to the phase three trial, um, including what makes this um, trial the most unique, which is the broad inclusion criteria. This um, discussion will include the resulting implications of this, of this effect, which is uh, a floor effect, and our ability to understand an appropriate view of the treatment effect observed in the trial um, in this context using pre-specified endpoints. Neuron is a technology platform and as a product that we have been studying, an investigational product in ALS has received orphan drug designation and fast drug designation status from the, uh, from the FDA. Uh, what this means, if you look on um, the um, FDA regulations and their website, this means that um, FDA will grant orphan disease um, status or designation status for drugs that show promise in the treatment, prevention, and diagnosis of diseases that affect people that ha um, have this disease and are 200,000 um, or less. Fast track designation is a process designed to facilitate the development and expedite the review of drugs for serious um, conditions and to fill unmet needs. And the purpose is to get important drugs to the patient um, earlier. On this slide, I wanted to outline just some of the key um, regulatory dates. So starting with the date that we filed our IND and started phase three, so dating back to 2013, and um, the phase three protocol was submitted to our IND in 2017. Other important meetings that are noted, um, a really important meeting where we reached agreement with the FDA on the totality of evidence that was being collected in the phase three trial and the appropriateness of the endpoints collected in the trial for a registration study. More recent events include the BLA filing, 
the refusal to file notification we received, the type A meeting that occurred one month later, the dispute resolution meeting, which resulted and provided clear steps to return our BLA back to active review and a commitment from FDA to an advisory committee, which we recently shared via press release. Brainstorm has been studying ALS with the goal of gaining regulatory approval for just under 10 years. And for those of you who aren't extremely close to drug development, on, um, we can look on published data and see that um, on average, it takes 11 to 13 years to develop and receive an approved, uh, approved product. This is for all approved products and their analyses um, that look at this over time. And there's obviously a wide range of timelines based on specific products, but we're currently in our review cycle process just below the average um, for a new product. We're all key keenly aware that ALS is a heterogeneous disease, and we're all um, very sad to reflect on the fact that it is uniformly a fatal illness. To tackle this disease, um, I believe we need different mod modalities in our arsenal of potential treatments. And I think that each investigational product in the trial we run help us learn more about ALS and provide different mechanism of actions that could help us um, improve our ability to help people living with ALS in the future. For now, our goal is focused on slowing the rate of decline, but I think as an industry and as a community, as we gain new insights, I expect we'll dare to dream bigger, and that is certainly all of our hopes. Neuron is a technology platform which adds a novel autologous cell therapy, um, a multimodal therapy in nature, um, to the breadth of investigational products that are currently under development. Neuron provides a personalized treatment using mesenchymal stem cells that are secreting neurotrophic factors that originate from the person that's actually being treated with the product. Mesenchymal stem cells or um, neuron MSC and TF cells, are, we use that interchangeably, have been shown to favorably modify neuroprotective and neuroinflammatory markers, um, biomarkers, and reduce neurodegenerative markers. Fast and reproducible manufacturing process means that we will um, be able for subsequent doses. So in our trials, what we've been able to see is after the initial dose, subsequent doses can be given in only seven days. Neuron as an as a investigational product is um, brings a lot of excitement as a, a novel cell therapy dating back to preclinical experiments that were um, have been conducted dating as early as 2007. We have um, done preclinical pre studies in Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, um, and autism as, two, as three examples. Um, earlier clinical trials and our phase three trial have shown that the mechanism of action aligns very well with the underlying pathology of ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. Our biomarker data across these trials, which include the largest run biomarker study in ALS in our phase three trial, demonstrate target engagement, and they strengthen the clinical evidence of neurons mechanism of action. So turning to our, um, our clinical plan and really the long standing commitment to ALS, we've conducted a series of four clinical trials, each published in a peer reviewed um, journal. The first two um, trials were published together. You can see in JAMA Neurology, followed by a phase 2B study in neurology and then phase three. The data from our phase three trial will be the focus of today. Our goal since our database lock has been to share our data openly and transparently with the medical and scientific community, starting with the podium presentation that was given less than a month from the top line data by one of our PIs, Merit Sedkowitz, which in addition to our primary publication in muscle and nerve included the full set of data from the trial. So all efficacy endpoints, pre-specified efficacy subgroups, safety and a high level review of biomarkers. And 2021 was a year of great learning as we completed all planned analyses outlined in two detailed analysis plans that were submitted to the FDA prior to unblinding the database. One of those analysis plans was focused on the clinical data 
the second on biomarker data. In last year, uh, 2022, and then this year, we've continued to gain insights into the trial. We collected vast amounts of information during the trial, including biomarker data and pharmacogenomic data. And we've continued to dig into and deeply understand this data. This was intended to not only understand the clinical utility of neuron, but also to explain why we were seeing benefits in the pre-specified and subsequent subgroups. This work has enabled us to understand the floor effect, which has been recognized by the FDA, but had not been explored in depth on the ALIS functional rating scale previously and to collect enough genetic data to inform future research on your own and serve as a guide to other research. We've shared openly at scientific and medical meetings as we've gained new insights for open discussion and debate. In case you haven't been through a peer-reviewed journal process, there are guardrails to this process that bring rigor and transparency to the review. Clinical trials are all well-planned. The endpoints and the analyses are laid out in advance, usually in two documents, in the protocol and in the analysis plan. In our case, this was across three documents since we had two analysis plans. And this ensures that there's no cherry picking um, and that there is data that really can be reviewed as consumers of an article. Anyone that is reviewing it can trust that the data is being published completely and as it was designed. In fact, as you look at the slide on the right, this is a screenshot of one of the pages out of the manuscript. You can see that all endpoints are shown in all participants. Also, every endpoint are presented by the subgroup threshold above and below 35. The only exception is noted in this paper is that SVC was not analyzed for this subgroup analysis because the study was conducted during the pandemic and the hospitals and private treating clinicians, um, many were unable to, con to collect SVC. We published a correction um, in, um, as an erratum in March of 2022. Um, what this basically equates to many of us, if you haven't done statistical programming, you probably have used Microsoft Word or Excel and we'll understand what a copy and paste error um, is. Effectively, this amounted to um, one endpoint and only subgroup analyses. There was a copy and paste error done by um, the group doing the statistical programming. And it was important to correct because this reports analyses as they were intended and as they were pre-specified um, in the documents submitted to the FDA. All other analyses, the primary endpoint and all subgroup of the primary were reported correctly. As a quick refresher to our design, we had a pretreatment period in the study. There was a screening period of 12 weeks and a confirmation of inclusion criteria across this pretreatment period. We had then a 28 week treatment period where participants were randomized to receive either neuron or placebo. Participants received three treatments across the study period. The trial was well run, and some of the characteristics that I think of when I say this are on the slide. There was a high completion rate, randomization was effective, the subgroups and the characteristics across treatments were balanced, the blind was preserved, and the treatment effect in both arms aligned with historical trials once we accounted for the floor effect. Across my presentation today, I'll be highlighting information we've shared at scientific and clinical meetings, um, many of which were just on the slide um, of our presentations. And you'll soon see the data that motivates these conclusions. But high level, um, from our phase three trial, we missed our primary endpoint and secondary efficacy endpoints in all trial participants. A pre-specified subgroup resulted in clinically meaningful treatment response on the primary and secondary endpoint. Participants with advanced ALS um, were included in the trial resulted in an inability to accurately measure disease progression. 
And we'll refer to this as the floor effect. Analyses that minimize the floor effect demonstrate an important treatment effect across endpoints. Biomarkers in all participants support the treatment effect that was observed. Safety at a high level, um, our data has been carefully reviewed by our principal investigators and the data safety monitoring board that monitored the trial. And as we published in our muscle and nerve paper, the, um, the treatment, the investigational treatment in this trial neuron was well tolerated and there were no safety concerns in the trial. I do have additional slides if there's interest and can go further with this information. Turning to the endpoints, we have um, on this slide, all of the pre-specified endpoints. The primary endpoint is a responder analysis. So we were looking to see if the investigational treatment neuron compared to placebo had a different response rate when you look at their rate of response pretreatment compared to their rate of response post-treatment. The definition to declare response is a change in that rate of decline of at least 1.25 points per month. And I'll illustrate this on a slide. We had other endpoints, the average change from baseline in the ALS functional rating scale to week 28, slow body capacity that I've already addressed um, was collected um, in the hospitals that were permitted through the, um, the COVID pandemic. We had other response definitions, the combined analysis of function and survival, and then we had um, biomarker data, both um, CSF samples and blood. All efficacy endpoints were analyzed using pre-specified subgroup analyses and um, defined by the, um, the baseline ALS FRSR as one critical um, baseline uh, pre-specified subgroup. For the remainder, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of the talk, I'm sorry, it's uh, spring and we have these beautiful flowers out here in Boston <laughs> and it's, uh, it's manifesting with a little bit of, um, of uh, congestion, I'm sorry. So for the remainder of the talk, um, I'm gonna focus on the two endpoints that are highlighted. The primary endpoint, that is um, very clear that that would be an area of focus. The second endpoint, which I'll focus on today, just given the length of our time and the inability to continue to go through all endpoints, is the average change from baseline. Um, this is an endpoint that um, was um, expressed as a, a great interest by the FDA. As you'll see from the full manuscript where we report all endpoints, when we account for the floor effect, the patterns that I'm showing you are reflected across other endpoints. So it's simply because of the time constraint, we're not going through all. To illustrate the primary endpoint so you can understand conceptually what we're describing, this is a single um, participant from the trial. The, to the left of the um, horizontal bar with the triangles, we see individual ALS FSR measurements that were pretreatment. So this participant was losing about 1.5 points per month. Then at the point of treatment, we can see it turns to circles and we see that the average rate of decline across this period turned from a negative 1.4 to right around zero. Point, um, the slope is 0 0.09. So to understand if this is a responder, and this would be done for every participant in the trial, we compare and subtract the post-treatment rate of decline from the pre-treatment rate of decline, and we get a difference of 1.52. When that number is larger than the threshold, the 1.25 points per month, we know that this meets that clinical response criteria and it is um, an important response that's observed in these participants. So turning to the key inclusion criteria, um, they're listed here. We had certainly more that are summarized in the manuscript, but we had um, a baseline criteria um, that um, was identified actually with screening. So the, the 18 weeks prior to baseline, we identified participants had to be 25 or higher on the ALS functional rating scale. This was actually lowered from um, a, a threshold of 30 in phase two. The rate of decline that was um, required for an inclusion criteria was that participants were losing three points or more in 12 weeks before randomization. So a, a, um, very equivalent to about a point per month. 
The goal with these were to ensure that we were not bringing a ceiling effect into the trial and that we had enough decline so that a treatment effect could be assessed in the trial if there in fact was a treatment effect. We had other inclusion criteria, two others that are very common and important, um, including um, the disease uh, symptom onset within 24 months of screening and a sole vital capacity measure that was 65% or greater of the predicted um, gender, height, and age um, at, at the screening visit. The, um, as specified in, in our criteria, the trial was not intended to be an extreme group of participants. In fact, you know, we know the average rate of decline observed in the population of people living with ALS is about a point per month. In fact, we did get a broad range of different baseline levels of ALS disease in the trial. In fact, um, the result that makes this study unique is that there was just a larger sample of participants enrolled in the study with baseline values that were at the lower end of the scale. So about three quarters of the trial falls within the range of other late phase trials with about a fourth not being typical of other trials and being um, more advanced in their ALS disease. So I'm going to present um, analyses. Actually, I need to move the, the Zoom. Bar. Okay, so I'm going to now start going through some of the analyses, and I will begin with um, on each slide. I'm presenting the primary endpoint um, and both the uh, alongside of that the secondary endpoint, the average change from baseline and the ALS functional rating Go scale. Ahead. So, if you um, if you look at what's in the box, each of the boxes, you can see all trial participants. And you can see with the primary endpoint, if we start on the left, we had 33% responders in the neurotreated participants versus 28% response with placebo. If you look at the footnote of this slide, you'll see that the um, assumptions going into the trial, we have the ability to look at historical databases and certainly internal um, trials to understand and, and um, estimate what you would expect in a trial. So looking at Historical trials, we see that we expected 15% placebo response versus 35% response with neuron. And we can see that the results in all trial participants was fairly similar for the ALS participants, but the placebo was different. In the average change from baseline, we see that there was um, a small difference in the rate of function that was lost across um, these uh, the, these 28 weeks. So the difference, neuron participants um, lost 5.5 points and placebo 5.8. If we look on the right of this slide, we now can see in the primary and the secondary endpoints in a pre-specified subgroup of um, people that had baseline scores above 35, this was a value that was selected and identified in all of our pre-specified materials because we thought it would represent the average um, of baseline scores. And what we can see when we look at these, um, at, at both of these boxes, we see that the, the rate of, of clinical response as outlined by the primary endpoint was 35% response rate on neuron treated participants and a 15.6% response or 16% response on placebo. So a, 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 um, approximately 20% difference between the rate of response across the treatment groups, aligning very closely with the power calculations. Similarly, when we um, look at the average change from baseline, as we expected, we see a two points, two points of function that are preserved with neuron compared to placebo, which um, is, um, is a meaningful um, difference. Okay, one thing we need to understand with the sample, we expected the threshold of 35 to have roughly half of the patients below and half of the patients um, above. Because we enrolled the set of participants that had more advanced ALS disease, this subgroup represents only 30% of the participants in the trial. This slide was included in the original presentation that Merritt um, showed in 2020, and it offers an important perspective, which is the treatment effect, which we just discussed all the way to the right at the end of the trial on the primary endpoint, 
35% response versus, um, versus 16, which was expected. But as we look across the longitudinal nature of all the times when the ALSFSR was, was, re, was collected, we see that there was a treatment response that was um, a treatment separation in the, um, the two um, arms in the trial that was visible at the first time point where we measured the ALS functional rating scale, so at week two, followed by week four and all the subsequent um, time periods. So it was an effect that was observed early and was maintained through the end of the trial. The slide similarly shows the average change from baseline longitudinally over the course of the trial. And we can see that there was a departure between the treatment groups starting after the second treatment at week eight with a two point difference in function that's observed um, across then the trial and um, at the end at, um, at week 28. I've already noted that there were participants that were included with advanced ALS, which points to a unique trial population in the study and a strong outlier compared to other late phase trials. If we compare the baseline average scores from this trial, and you can see um, on the very bottom um, item, the phase three trial of neuron and the average baseline score of 31, we can see that with the dots that are in red, these are the recently approved products, um, that the neuron phase three trial was five points below the MLX registration trial Phoenix, six points below Tafersen, and 11 points below the Adirovone registration trial J19. On this slide, you can see the FDA hosted a workshop about floor effects and explained that a floor effect can occur at an item level or at a scale level. And the definition that they describe is that this occurs when a scale of measure is not able to capture progression at the bottom of the scale. As I referenced earlier, we had 25% of the participants in the trial with baseline scores 25 or below. In these participants, we see a high rate of individual ALS FSR items that were focused in the fine and gross motor subscales that started at zero. So on average, you can see across these six items, which is half of the scale, we can see about 40% of the baseline scores across these participants were starting at zero. This is especially problematic to the measure of the overall ALS um, functional rating scale total score because ALS experts such as Jeremy Scheffner and the author of the scale, one of the authors, Jesse Cedarbaum, estimate that about 70% of decline occurs in the fine and gross motor subdomains. From a primary endpoint perspective, this plays out in a very important way um, because it results in a misclassification of, of uh, an error that's brought into the results. So this must be addressed in order to draw valid treatment conclusions. And I will um, walk you through why, why that is. But in essence, if we take at face value without representing the inability of a scale to measure ongoing decline for a set of participants with advanced ALS, the data would suggest that those with the worst outcomes have a clinical response. A similar phenomena from our trial that we actually anticipated in advance of the, um, of the trial um, had to do with when we observe, um, if we were to observe deaths in the course of the trial. In this, um, in this case, we understood even if the ALS FSR data um, resulted in a calculation that would say the person was a responder, if a person died, they would automatically, their response would be considered a non-responder. So similarly, we know that we need to account for the inability of the scale to measure decline to be carried into the results um, of analyses. And the good news is that we can still draw valid treatment conclusions in the trial, conclusions that are protected by randomization. And we'll look at analyses today that are both pre-specified and post hoc that account for the floor effect and allow us to review conclusions reached in the trial. To illustrate the kind of plateauing that can occur in the impact with the floor effect, these were shown very recently at the MDA 
annual clinical and scientific conference, we wanted to explore if we could identify this plateauing that occurs and to be able to explore the impact that and the, and the, the effect of having zeros that were driving the plateauing. And as you can see from these two examples, there was one in the, um, this is one example from the phase three neuron study and one from the PROACT database. First, we observed this pattern. This was um, an independent um, analytic tool that is designed um, to identify this kind of elbow shape. We were able to identify this pattern in 5% of the PROACT participants and in about 22% of participants in the neuron phase three trial. You can see from these two examples that there was a very high rate of zeros occurring across these participants, which was the case of individuals across um, that, were, that were identified with this, this response. And you can also understand with this visual um, how this would be a misclassification of results um, with, with the primary endpoint. If a person is able to decline, and then has a plateauing because we are unable to measure ongoing decline, they would meet the criteria for a clinical response when in fact it is reflecting only that the scale cannot measure further decline. There were sensitivity analyses that were conducted and were part of the muscle and nerve manuscript. This allowed us to look at how consistent the trends are in the data beyond just looking at the pre-specified subgroup. So as you know, we chose the pre-specified subgroup expecting that about 50% would be above and below. I've already identified that it was only about a third of patients that were in this data set above. And we can see that neuron participants, when we start with um, the 35 subgroup all the way to the right, we previously have looked at that data, we can then go down to the left and say, if we had looked up 34 and above or 33 and above, all the way down to the bottom of the scale where we know we start to run into a floor effect. And you can see that there is very great consistency on the primary endpoint of the rate of response, the percent of patients that were randomized to neuron and the response rates that's observed across all of these subgroups. You can also see there is a marked difference between placebo and neuron. If you prefer tables um, rather than graphs in the manuscript, um, they are um, all reported in detail. This is the same analysis, but applied to the average change from baseline to week 28. We can see that neuron participants with less advanced disease had greater preservation of function compared to those that had more advanced disease but importantly, the treatment difference across all thresholds presented here was two points or higher with the average change from baseline to week 28 um, preserved in the 27 and above subgroups. Okay, and that's, this, this slide in, 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 incorporates about 77% 70 per, 70, of the data, almost 80% of the data. Returning to the floor effect and to look at the extent of the floor at baseline in two ways, so you have transparency into the, um, the uh, data that we observed in this trial. On the left, we can see the number of items that started at zero in all participants in the trial that are ordered from their lowest baseline score and all the way up to the highest baseline score. So if you have really good vision, you can see that there was one individual that had a value of 16 at baseline, that person had five items at baseline starting at zero. If you look in the lower part of the scale, we can see that on average, these participants had between four and six items starting with zero. And this rate of um, the, the count of zeros across items then declines rapidly to where the higher levels um, you have uh, fewer fewer to, to no items starting with, um, with zero. If you look to the right, you can see the, um, the, this, this graph shows the same presentation of, of uh, participants starting with the lowest baseline score up to the, the highest. And they're considered having evidence of a floor effect and are listed as red, the percent that are red, if they had at least one item, so one or more. 
So we can see based on this graph that 100% of people that had baseline scores of 24 and below had at least one item at zero at baseline. We can also see that the higher levels, the rate of having a value or even where there are none, which allows us the ability to look at individuals where we know the scale was able to measure decline across all components of the scale as intended. So we can see that baseline total scores was actually a pretty decent way of identifying those that were impacted, but we can also observe that for some of these baseline levels, we still see people that have a high rate of at least one zero at baseline. So to take this further and to allow for more precision, we can now use this to identify participants that have no evidence of a floor effect at baseline, those that are in the green on this graphic. And we can now present these analyses looking at the primary and the key secondary, secondary endpoint. So just like before, we have the primary endpoint and secondary endpoint um, uh, on the slide, and we'll start with um, we'll start with the, um, the the analyses that are in the box. So these are the individuals that had no evidence of a floor effect at baseline, the green on the last slide, and we can see that in these participants. First, this is more than half of the patients in the trial had no evidence of a floor effect at baseline. And on the primary endpoint, we see that there is close to a 20% difference in the clinical response rate that's observed. So 41% versus 23%. When we look at the average change from baseline, we can again see that we have a difference that's greater than two points on the A-list functional rating scale. And um, again, consistent with analyses that we observed in the pre-specified subgroup. For transparency, I've included the alternate set of, um, of data, which is those that had a floor effect. We know that um, given the, um, the um, amount of individuals that had numerous items with zeros and were certainly plateauing in the trial, um, we know that this has to be interpreted very carefully because of the misclassification that's brought into um, the analysis for the primary endpoint and also into the secondary endpoint. So if we put these two methods for accounting for the treatment effect on the same slide, one that was pre-specified, one that was post hoc, and defined by an objective measure, which is really focused on the item, um, the lack of items um, that, have in, that have zero. So basically everybody had items across the entire scale that could, um, that, that could measure progression as it occurred. We see with the primary endpoint across both of these that we had a 20%, approximately 20% difference between treatment groups on the primary endpoint. And on the secondary endpoint, we see two points of function preserved with neuron treatment compared to placebo at week 28. The last few slides I want to review with you is going into our biomarker data, which is reinforcing of the clinical outcomes and conclusions that we just reviewed. And given the time that we have remaining, I'll stay relatively high level, um, although I'm happy to share additional details if we have time and there's interest. So um, we also have a biomarker manuscript um, that we hope will be available in the near future um, that will provide a very transparent view into all biomarkers that were collected. So first, the biomarkers we collected are legitimate. They were scientifically motivated and they're all relevant to ALS. We had an analysis plan that guided and outlined prospectively the analysis um, of this data, and we've analyzed them very rigorously. As I stated earlier, this is the largest biomarker study ever in people living with ALS. CSF samples were collected at seven time points, seven different time points in all trial participants providing a longitudinal view into the biological changes observed in the trial across pathways important to ALS. We analyzed 45 CSF biomarkers, all relevant to ALS disease and with primary pathways identified from the literature. There were three important conclusions. Number one, the treatment effect observed in this trial is consistent with the mechanism of action and biomarker data from other trials. We observed statistically significant differences in treatments um, 
based on the biomarkers, and I'll actually summarize that for you in a table on the next slide. We observed neuron, a neuron treatment effect, which was consistent in all treatment participants, including those with advanced ALS disease, where the ALS functional rating scale demonstrated measurement challenges. Changes observed with neuron on biomarkers are also shown to be relevant to the clinical outcomes observed in the trial. There were biomarkers selected by a pre-specified model designed to identify CSF biomarkers that predicted clinical outcomes in the trial with neuron, but not with placebo. So going into two more slides to provide some details, the biomarker data in all trial participants showed consistent biological patterns of neuron reducing markers of inflammation and neuro neurodegeneration and increasing neuroprotective markers relative to placebo. And you can see in this table, we've identified all of the um, biomarkers by their primary pathway and the percent where we saw an overall significant treatment effect or a treatment by time effect showing that there was a significant difference um, between neuron and placebo treated participants. So over 60% of neuroinflammatory markers were statistically there was a significant treatment effect, um, around 40% of neurodegenerative markers and 78% of neuroprotective markers. In terms of the relationship between biomarkers and clinical outcomes, we observed um, three biomarkers were selected by a statistical model, it was pre-specified, that predict the clinical outcome or explain the, in the clinical um, outcomes that are observed in the trial. And this was true of neuron, but not of placebo. So you'll see the three markers on this slide, LAP or TGF-beta is commonly known in the literature, neurofilament light, and galactin-1. So what's important to note is that markers of each of the three pathways that we know are very important in ALS were selected in the final model. This is not something that um, was, was expected or was influenced. These were observed, um, and these were the markers that were most able to predict and provide a prediction of the clinical outcomes observed. Also, the relationship between biomarkers and clinical outcomes, now we can understand that three markers actually are important in providing insight into the clinical responses observed in the trial. So in summary, we know that neuron in all trial participants um, had marginally better outcomes on both the primary and the secondary endpoints. There were non-significant um, uh, in endpoints um, that improved, and when we observed and accounted for the floor effect, and we have done so in many other um, presentations and using different methods, we see that there are stronger outcomes that are clinically meaningful once we control for the floor effect using both pre-specified and post-hoc methods. We know and have observed that treatments with neurons significantly elevates markers of neuroprotection and lowers markers of neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration over time compared to placebo. And again, all of the biomarker results are in all trial participants. Statistical modeling identifies biomarkers that have the potential to predict a clinical response with neuron. And we observe the ability with three markers um, to do so, to explain the variability and, and predict the outcomes that are observed in this trial. Lastly, the same biomarker responses, including patterns by treatment, are observed across biomarker pathways and participants, including those with advanced ALS. With that, I will um, thank um, and recognize the prestigious um, sites and investigators that were involved in this trial, um, and thank the organizations that helped fund the trial um, in addition to biomark the biomarker sub-study with the California Research Institute, the um, ALSA ALS Association, and IMALS. And with that, I will turn it um, over for questions. Thank you so much, Stacy. What an incredible presentation. Let's go ahead and start the question and answer section of the talk series. 
Brian, why don't you go ahead and lead us off? Oh, perfect. Again, so I guess my first question is, are there any investigations of PALS more than two years since sy symptom onset? And a follow-up question is that, is there a difference between 18 months and two years of symptom onset of ALS? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, you know, clinical trials are always very carefully outlined in terms of the inclusion criteria. So we set inclusion criteria and then we enroll participants that meet that criteria. So the clinical trial, um, the phase three clinical trial um, included participants that were within two years of their symptom onset. So that is who was enrolled. And then, of course, um, you know, we um, we then uh, analyze that data and, and can reflect on the, the data that's come from those patients. Thank you. Okay. So is neuron being offered as a legal treatment in any country in the world? It is not approved. It's an investigational product. We are currently under active review at the FDA and are um, seeking regulatory approval in the U.S., but it is not, um, it is not approved in any country at this moment. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Next question is, do you think the 18th month pre-treatment period played a role in the number of participants who started the treatment period with floor effect measures? So I think what's important um, in any trial um, is to understand um, the participants um, and, and their, their representation of when they enter the trial. So there's no question that the combination of the screening ALS-FSR value um, of 25 and that combined with a rate of decline that was three, um, three points across uh, 12 weeks or one point per month, um, that there was a set of participants that certainly were either starting low or declining more rapidly than was expected so that we ended up with a sample of about 25 uh, um, percent of the participants. So. That's something that a trial can easily, and even with a with a pre-treatment period, that you can you can model and understand what their likely baseline values are. But certainly those combination of inclusion criteria resulted in just a larger percentage of participants than were expected um, based on the inclusion criteria. Great. Thank you so much, Stacy. Now, uh, a question we had from the community was, did you correct for, uh, did you correct the ALS FRSR rate change for use of NIV? So, um, so first we did not have any permanent ventilation in our trial. Um, we did not in the, um, in the um, outlined analyses, but these are analyses that we would um, always look into and understand if there were differences between treatment groups and account for them. But I don't believe in the, in the core um, uh, model that it was, um, that it was pre-specified. Perfect. It is something we did look into though, that I'm confident of. Great. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Next question is to address participants reaching zero on ALS FRS, is looking at other secondary endpoints, an example, biomarkers, help in seeing a response in TX? So biomarkers are a very important part of, um, you know, with, with all of the analyses that I just walked you through, and we have done um, many different um, uh, ways of identifying the floor effect and, uh, and thinking through how we can appropriately reflect them. Many of these have been inspired by leading neurologists have given us great ideas of how we should interrogate the data. Um, if I had more time, I would have actually gone through more of them. What's very striking is how consistent when we account for the data and we look for the floor effect in many ways, how consistent it is that we go from seeing really a very marginal treatment effect in all participants to being able to observe um, something more similar to, um, to what we expected from a, a powering and a planning perspective. Um, in terms of the biomarker data and the specific question, What's important is it is a second and more um, biomarker data is very objective in the sense that we have samples, they're sent away to a lab and they're analyzed. There is no subjective rating, which of course all scales bring subjectivity into the measurements. Um, and what's very important then, if we look at to the best of our ability, we've taken this back 
to something very objective, an inability of a scale to measure decline, which then you certainly are not going to be able to assess a treatment effect. We know that those ratings will depart from the clinical um, manifestation of disease and really the presentation in, in the participants if the score has plateaued and you can't measure decline. Biomarkers are not going to be impacted in that way. In fact, we can actually observe in all trial participants the same patterns. We interrogated um, and looked at the biomarker data in participants where we actually saw the floor effect of the scale, and we see the same patterns in reducing. So neuron is reducing markers of neurodegeneration, reducing markers of inflammation, and reducing in, in, in um, increasing markers of neuroprotection um, in participants that are below 25 on the ALS functional rating scale baseline, as well as those that are above. So what we can see in the biomarker data is that neuron is biologically active and having a very similar effect across, across the range of um, baseline disease severity. That becomes very reinforcing of what we believe is happening with the scale data and, um, and the need to adjust for the floor effect and be able to draw conclusions in that context. That's great, Stacy. Thank you so much. Um, I particularly love this next question um, because someone in the audience already answered their version of it. What is the positive effect in the placebo group? A positive effect. Can well, you, or, I'm so sorry. Why is there such a positive effect in the placebo oh, group? Someone okay. in the chat mentioned that the power of the mind is so important. And so um, mm -hmm. that was just a nice little thing to add. Yeah, no, that's an interesting way of describing it. And I would say that across many diseases, um, I've, I've been involved with drug development across many different diseases and placebo response is something that's very real and you have to address in clinical trials. We actually um, don't believe that we've seen anything other than what we expected. If you go back to the graphs that I showed you, and prior to the study, we went through and very rigorously looked at completed trials and looked at the inclusion criteria and estimated, based on other clinical trials, how many placebo patients, so people that were randomized to receive placebo, actually met that, that clinical criteria. And we expected it would be 15%. So, this trial does not appear to have anything that is unusual in terms of placebo response. Um, what we believe is very much real, and again, taking it back to the scale, we know the scale, once you reach a zero, you're not able to quantify any further progression um, that is happening. And um, so the, the, the main effect that needs to be understood um, in this trial is a floor effect. It's not a placebo effect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stacey. That's super mm -hmm. clarifying. And, and since you mentioned that, could you quickly re-explain the floor effect? Um, I think that that's something that um, some people were just a tiny bit confused on. Sure. So a floor effect, if I go back to the definition that the FDA used um, in this workshop that they conducted, um, they described what could either be at an individual item level. So any scale that exist that has um, a range, um, the ALS functional rating scale goes from zero to 48. Any scale that's bounded, and that's pretty much every scale, can have individual items that reach zero, and that would be an individual item floor effect, or it can actually be at a total score level. The definition that the FDA used in this workshop was that a floor effect occurs when the scale of measurement is not able to capture progression at the bottom of the scale. And as I showed on the slides, we're able to show that plateauing and equate that to um, numerous items in, um, in the, the ALS functional rating scale that are reaching zero in, in, the, in the study period, and therefore that aligns with that plateauing, um, which is, is what we're describing as a floor effect. Perfect, Stacey. Thank you so much for, for explaining that. Now we have reached time. Um, Stacey, can I ask if you have any last remarks that you wanted to say to this um, Everything ALS community? Yeah, I, you know, first I'm grateful to be here. I do appreciate um, everybody that showed up and wanted to understand the evidence that we have put together. Um, we've been very carefully and very objectively trying to bring forward evidence 
um, that we have learned from our trial. We firmly believe that an advisory committee um, is the right place for the community to evaluate and um, to allow for a rigorous and objective discussion of the merits. We're grateful to the FDA for, um, for allowing that discussion. We believe that it honors the needs of those living with ALIS um, and that, um, that it is the most important discussion that we can engage in is to, to represent our data fairly. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.